Experiment 1 is about spectroscopic identification of an unknown organic compound. The learning objective of this experiment is to identify an unknown organic compound using spectroscopy such as IR and NMR and mass spectrometry techniques. This is the procedure to determine the structure of the unknown. First, use the IR spectrum to determine the functional groups present in the molecule and use IR absorption band table as a guide. Next, use the NMR spectra to assign the proton and carbon-13 peaks in the molecule. Use NMR table of chemical shifts as a guide. Then, use the mass spectrum to determine the molecular weight in fragmentation patterns of the molecule. Put the pieces together and draw the structure of the unknown. Based on the structure drawn, assign the IR, proton, and carbon-13 NMR, and the mass spectral data for the unknown. Refer to the example provided in the next slides. This is an example of an unknown that will be assigned for each student. There's going to be four different uh, spectral data that will be provided. And the first one is going to be the IR spectrum, and then mass spectrum, proton, and carbon-13 NMR spectral data. You should be able to distinguish that it's going to be an IR because it's percent transmittance versus the wave number and it's going from 4,000 to 400 per centimeter. The mass spec is a plot of the intensity versus the M over Z or mass over charge. All of our data, the charge will be one, so therefore the M over Z is basically just the um, weight or the mass. The proton NMR is going to be in chemical shift and the unit is going to be ppm or parts per million and it goes from 0 to 10 or 12. The carbon-13 is the same chemical shift or delta ppm and it goes from 0 to about 220. This is how you're going to analyze the data and how you are going to label the absorption bands and the peaks. So for the IR, you start on the left side and then you are going to determine what the absorption bands are using the table. In this case, it's gonna be this area corresponds to NH2 stretch you have like a doublet, it's about 33,000, 34,000. Uh, and then there's a peak here, which is weak intensity below 3,000, corresponding to the CH aromatic stretch. There's a strong absorption band in this region, which is about close to 1,700 or 1,650, and that's gonna be a C double bond O stretch. And then C double bond C stretch, this two medium intensity absorption band corresponding to that C double bond C stretch. And that's going to be the assignment for the IR. The fingerprint region, you can just ignore that. So uh, about less than 1,000, you can just ignore this region. The mass spectrum contains the, um, the plot of the intensity on the y-axis versus the m over z. And again, as I mentioned, the z is going to be the charge, which is plus 1. So the x-axis basically will just be the weight or the mass of the molecular ion peak or the molecular weight of the molecule and the fragments. In this example, the molecular weight is odd, and that's labeled as m plus. And because it's odd, it's going to be containing one nitrogen. For our examples, we will have either just one nitrogen or no nitrogen. So this is the nitrogen rule. If it's an odd number molecular weight, you will have one N. 
If it's even, you don't have any nitrogen in the molecule. So molecular weight of the molecule is going to be 121 grams per mole, or simply 121. The fragments coming from this molecule will be 121 minus 16, it's going to be 105. And then 121 minus 44, it's 77. So going back, um, you can also determine what is being lost from 105 minus 77 is 28. So that means you have possibly a carbon and an oxygen because carbon is 12 and oxygen is 16, that's 28. So you're losing 28 mass from 105 to 77. The presence of 77 is indicative of a benzene. And if you go from 77 to 51, you subtract 77 minus 51 is 26, or 77 minus 26 is 51. And this indicates, again, the presence of the fragmentation pattern coming from benzene when you're losing an ethyne or acetylene. Or C2H2, that becomes 26, and that would give you 77 minus this fragment, because this is a stable fragment, it's easily lost from benzene, and you will now have 51. So 77 and 51 are typically indicative of the presence of the aromatic structure, which is the benzene. So all these little guys in here are just isotopes, and we are just basically concerned about the major peaks, in this case 121, 105, 77, and 51. So this one we can uh, analyze later as we construct the pieces of the molecule. So this little guy in here are actually isotopes coming from each of the atoms present in the molecule. So the next step that you have to uh, know is now start drawing the pieces and know how to add the atomic weights of the pieces. So I put here the atomic weights of each of the um, elements or the atoms in gram per mole, or simply we're just going to put one for hydrogen, 12 for carbon, nitrogen 14, oxygen 16. These are the most abundant um, isotopes of H, C, N, and O. However, for chlorine and bromine, uh, it's 35 and 37 in the ratio of 3 is to 1 present in nature. So use 35 for chlorine, but remember that there's an isotope at 37, which is M plus 2, and the ratio of that is 3 is to 1. And then bromine, the atomic weight is 79, and then the other isotope is 81, the difference of 2, but the ratio of this occurring naturally is 1 is to 1. So these are the atomic weights that you need to use in order to add together uh, for the whole molecule. So for now, uh, for unknown H, add the weights of the pieces. So we know from the IR spectrum that we have NH2, and N is 14, 2 times 1 for hydrogen, it's 16. And then we also have a carbon 2 O, carbon double bond O, and that's going to be 12, and 16, that's 28. Total is 44. For the mass spectrum, the molecular weight is odd, which is 121. This confirms the presence of 1N, which is an odd molecular weight, which confirms the presence of NH2 from the IR spectrum. And we also know that in the mass spectrum, it indicates the presence of benzene. Benzene, as it is, is C6H6. So you have six carbons, six Hs, so that's 78 grams per mole or 78 you have six H's around the ring, one H, one H on each of the carbon. If you take out one H that's monosubstituted, in this case you take out one H that's C6H5, which becomes 78 minus one, it's 77. So that 77 is monosubstituted benzene. So now we have this piece, and then we also have NH2 and C double bond O. We're going to construct the components in the structure in the correct order following rules of bonding and Lewis structures. 
So we have a monosubstituted benzene. You cannot put NH2 first and then CO around. So basically, we only have monosubstituted structure. It could be disubstituted, but it will not work. So first, let's do monosubstituted. So what is the order? Can we put NH2 first and then CO hanging? That will not fit. So basically, you put C double bond O first because this needs two bonds. So one bond is going to be used up to connect to the benzene, and then the other bond to NH2. Not NH2 and then CO. So now we have a picture in mind about what the structure of this unknown H is. This is now the proton NMR spectrum for unknown H. So for the proton, you typically don't have a Y scale or Y axis, but you will have an X axis. So for the proton NMR, it starts from 0 to about 10 or 12 ppm. In this case, we have 2, 4, 6, 8. And this region here on the left side is called your deshielded region or the downfield region of the spectrum. Right on the right side in this region, this is the shielded region or the upfield region. It's a little bit counterintuitive. For this example, we now have a benzene and then we have five H's and it's assigned as B and these are the same. Because of the symmetry of the molecule, we have also C the same. They, these are equivalent um, H's to B, and then equivalent H's assigned as C, and then D is unique. So you have also H's on the end, which typically would be broad because of hydrogen bonding. So H on the N and H on the O are typically broad, and you can find that anywhere between 1 to 6 or so ppm. In this case, it's actually around 3, and then close to 7, which are the H's on the end. And then the aromatic region, it's around 7.2, and then to around 8 or so are the H's on the benzene. Now, these lines are called integration lines, and then this corresponds to the number of H's in that P. In this case, for the NH2, H's on the end, so you're measuring from the bottom to the top, and then bottom to the top. You can see that this height are the same. So we assign this as one Hs, one Hs. You can measure this with a ruler, and it's an arbitrary assignment, and it's re relative to this height. It's a ratio. So the height is almost the same, so it's one is to one ratio. However, for this case, the bottom to the top is almost twice this height from the bottom to the top. So we assign that as two H's for B. So that's gonna be the most shifted or the most downfield shifted because it's close to the C double bond O. This is electron withdrawing. Now the C and D we cannot differentiate. It's all bunched up together. And we assign that as three from here to the top. This is about two to three ratio or three times this height in here. So you have a lot of split because this is being split by this CHS as well as this C is splitting that or there's also a long range splitting by the D. So you have a lot of splitting caused by, by the neighboring H's for the C and D. C is being split by D and D is being split by C. That's why you have a lot of peaks splitting each other. So this is how you are going to write assignment for your assigned unknown for the proton NMR. This is the carbon-13 NMR spectrum. And the same thing as the proton NMR, you are going to use the um, table of chemical shifts as a guide to determine the region 
where the carbon or the proton would appear. In this case, the NMR spectrum for carbon-13, you don't have a y-axis or y-scale, but you have also the x-scale. It goes from a higher region to a low region, and the unit is ppm. So typically, it's from 0 to 220, and it's about 20 times the scale for a proton NMR. So this region, which is on the left side, it's going to be called the downfield region at a higher frequency. And this is also the disshielded region. The region which is on the right side is going to be the upfield region, and that's going to be the shielded region of the spectrum. So we now have the structure, supposedly, of our unknown H and um, the carbons are assigned in here and we have seven carbons one is the c double bond o which is labeled as e and it's the that's going to be and e is going to be the most downfield shifted carbon on the left side followed by the aromatic region and there are no carbons in the aliphatic region on the right side so if we assign on the benzene, the carbons, F is going to be what is called the quaternary carbon, no H attached to it, and then B are equivalent, and then C also equivalent, but D is unique because of the symmetry in the molecule that cuts across diagonally. So you will have one, two, three, four, five peaks or five unique carbons. And then in the aromatic region, you have four peaks or four aromatic Cs. So the most downfield shifted is going to be F, and that's the uh, carbon that is directly attached to the C double bond now, which is electron withdrawing. And then followed by B to D, B, C, and D. And F is a small peak because of the fact that it doesn't have any H attached to it. If the carbons for example, in the benzene contain H's, they will have, it will show up as a large P. So this is how you're going to label or assign the peaks in the carbon-13 for your unknown. The procedure shown earlier to determine the structure of the unknown uh, makes use of the IR spectrum first to determine the functional groups. That is very useful because it gives you right away what functional groups are present. And then next is you can use the mass spec because it gives you right away the molecular weight. So you cannot have more than one H or you cannot have less one H. It has to be the right number of uh, carbons, H's, N's, O's, or the halogens, and it cannot be more than that. So, or you can directly go to NMR spectra because it would give you also an indication of the presence of aromatic structure or just aliphatic structure. The carbon-13 also would confirm the presence of C double bond O, for example, that you've seen in the IR spectrum. So it doesn't have to be in this order. You can go back and forth, and the data and the structure that you come up with should not contradict whatever results you have for each of the spectral data. So it has to confirm and it has to synchronize the structure and the data. So you go, you go back and forth between the structure and the data and it should not be conflicting, it should not contradict the structure that you wrote. And again, finally, you have to use the table for the IR spectra and again, you have to use the table for the IR absorption bands, the molecular weight or the atomic weights for the, uh, each of the atoms, and then the um, table of chemical shifts for the proton and carbon-13 as a guide to determine where the proton and the carbons would appear in the spectrum. Finally, you are going to write a lab report and this is an example. So you have a, um, 
you are gonna you are going to be given a template to populate so you are going to put in the box the proposed structure of the molecule and then summarize as a table a IR data B mass spectral data C proton NMR data and then D as the carbon 13 NMR data so you tabulate for example, for the IR data, the wave number of position per centimeter, and then the type of vibration, intensity, shape, and then the functional group. So intensity is either going to be strong, medium, or weak. And then if it's sharp, or it's splitting as a doublet, and then the assigned functional group. Mass spectral data is going to be the mass, or M over Z. Those are the large peaks major peaks in the mass spec, and then what are the assigned fragments, and then assignment, and then what are the functional groups that can be assigned for those fragments. And then proton NMR chemical shift, delta PPM, where they are located in the x-axis, the position, and then multiplicity is going to be either singlet, doublet, triplet, quartet, or multiplet, and then integration corresponds to the number of H's under the peak, and then the assignment. Finally, the carbon-13 NMR data, the same thing as the proton. You have a chemical shift delta PPM, and then the X scale PPM, and then the number of carbons, and then the assignment. And that's going to be your um, lab report for experiment one.